Well, here it is. A 1 MHz frequency counter I put together for kicks. And best of all, you can build an exact copy of this one for less than $25. And I'm going to show you how I built it. In a previous video, I demonstrated this homebrew frequency counter I built many years ago, including its construction and ultimate failure due to operator error. Yeah, that means I screwed up. Well, I decided to build a new one and also to make everything related to the design open source. This means you can get the schematic and program code for free. Okay, so let's get started. For this build, you will need the following parts. Now you can download the schematic and the program code from magidavid.com. You'll need the following tools as well. Soldering iron, solder, wire cutters, screwdriver, and a hot glue gun, and miscellaneous tools. Okay, let's take a quick look at the breadboard version and see it in action. Okay, I began this design by first building the circuit on a breadboard and then writing the code. The 7404 inverter is located here in his very basic input circuit protection and also input signal conditioning. I plan on adding a more comprehensive input protection circuit down the road. The PIC 16F1516 MCU is located here. And here are the five 2N4401 MPN transistors. The seven segment four digit display is here. The input signal is connected to gate 1 on this inverter and then flows into the second gate. This provides a little buffering and helps clean up the signal before it goes into the MCU. The signal enters the MCU's 16-bit counter, which is monitored by the firmware for an overflow. And when an overflow occurs, an 8-bit internal counter is incremented to keep track of the high order 8 bits. This 24-bit count gives us a total maximum count of 16.777 MHz. However, since the MCU is running at 16 MHz, it's doubtful we could ever get an accurate count that high, or even close for that matter. And the current firmware is designed to only display 999.9 kHz. But you can modify the code to display higher values if you want to. Okay, as you can see, the frequency counter is fluctuating between 22 and 23 Hz, with the function generator set to 23.4 Hz. Now, let's increase the input signal to 22.36 kHz, and the frequency counter is reading 22.32 kHz. And with the input signal set to 232.08 kHz, the frequency count reads 231.4. So it's obvious there's some difference here, but how far off are we in percentage? Well, let's find out. Okay, so let's take 1 and subtract the result of 2.339 divided by 2.347. And that gives us 0.00341 or 0.34%. Holy crap! That's a 0.34% tolerance. Really? Not bad at all for a hacked together frequency counter that I designed and built in under a week. Nah, that can't be right. Let's do some more math and check it to make sure. So 2.339 plus 2.339 multiplied by 0 0.00341 is equal to 2.339 plus 0 0.00797 and that gives us an answer of 2.34698. And our source frequency is 2.347 kilohertz, and our math gives us 2.34698 kilohertz. Okay then, so it's safe to say that this frequency counter has an accuracy of less than one half of a percent. Wow, that's, yeah, wow. Okay, well, let, let us build this puppet. Okay, since the project box has an area set aside specifically for a display, and this is the reason I chose this box for this, this design, I lined up the smaller PC board with the display area and marked where I wanted the drill holes to be. To aid in this, I also temporarily inserted the LED display unit to help center the board. I then put on the cover to make sure it would fit and everything was centered. Then I marked the holes with a sharpie. After drilling the holes, I soldered in the display unit to the PC board. 
Next, I marked the PC board where I wanted pin 1 to be. This was done to aid in wiring up the board and also to be able to match wires up to the main board. Then I began soldering in the 390 ohm resistors with the LED display. Next, I soldered in the transistors with the collector of each transistor soldered into the top power rail. This reduced the number of wires for power I would have to connect to just one. Okay, with 1K ohm resistors soldered in, all the components for the display module were complete. The next step consisted of connecting everything to the bottom section of the board with wires. For this task, I used 22 gauge solid core wire. As I wired up the display, I made sure that every component, including the wires, would be at or below the height of the LED display. I didn't want any of the components causing a problem with the fitting of the display into the project box. Next, I added in wires to run from the display to the main board and I used the exact same color wires to aid in keeping things straight. Once completed, I powered up the display to test all the connections and make sure I had everything right. This is when I discovered a solder bridge that was activating segment B and G at the same time. I quickly identified the issue and then proceeded to correct the error. Once this was done, I tested the display again and everything worked perfectly. Next, I test fitted the display into the project box. To space the display away from the face of the lens, I used four number four 3 8 inch screws with nuts to secure the screw to the PC board. This created a perfect standoff for the display. Also, I didn't tighten the nuts down. Doing so would have prevented the screw from turning. I also had to make sure the screw tips didn't extend past the holes in the project box. I used a simple IR filter trimmed to size to protect the display and also to help with contrast. This lens is listed in the parts list for the project. Next, I drilled two holes in the project box to accommodate the BNC connector and also the power switch. With the holes drilled, I test fitted the BNC connector to make sure it would fit, wouldn't interfere with the display board, and could be sufficiently tightened to prevent the connector from rotating when a mating connector was attached. Okay, with the display done and the enclosure prep work completed, I began working on the main PC board. First up, I soldered in the sockets for the PIC 16F, 1516, and the inverter IC. Then I soldered in the 6-pin strip header for the programming port and then added in the 5-volt regulator and its supporting capacitors. Next, I added in the bypass caps for the two chips. Then I wired up the programming port to the fix 16 f 1516 and then tested to make sure this portion of the circuit would work correctly. Everything checked out just fine. I then connected the ground and power jumper wires for the inverter IC and the MCU. Next, I finished making the connections required to connect the main PC board to the display PC board. Then I began connecting the display module to the main PC board. With everything wired up, it was time to test the circuit and make sure everything worked before installing it into the project box. And it worked just fine. Well, with one exception. When I first powered up, odd characters were displayed on the screen and I tracked this down to a firmware issue, which I corrected. Next, I soldered wires to the BNC connector and its grounding washer, and then installed the BNC connector into the enclosure. I made sure to tighten the nut as much as possible without damaging the plastic. It's important to note that the star washer inside is critical here. It keeps the nut from loosening. As you can see, properly installed, the BNC connector performs perfectly. Next, I installed the display. Then I installed the 9 volt battery connector, which comes with the enclosure, and then soldered the ground wire to the main PC board and the red wire to the power switch. Fortunately, this PC board is just the right size to be wedged down into the case, and the wires leading from the main PC board to the display board aid in keeping the main board in place. You'll also notice that I left this one side of the PC board blank. This gives the wires coming from the display a place to settle into without having to worry about them getting damaged or causing damage. Next, I installed two screws to hold the case together while I installed the display cover. This is a part for a different style project box, and I had to trim the lens to fit inside the display cover. When I trimmed this one, I got lucky and it broke in such a way that it could be wedged into the display cover, allowing for easy test fitting. However, this wasn't a permanent solution, so I used my hot glue gun to permanently attach the infrared lens to the display cover. This project box also comes with two 
glue strips to adhere the display cover to the main enclosure. I found the glue strips somewhat difficult to install as the paper on one side didn't want to lift away from the glue strip. I did manage to get the glue strips down, but it wasn't easy. With the glue strips in place, I installed the display cover for the last time. And then I tested the unit and everything worked perfectly. Okay, I think that pretty much covers the build. You can find the schematic, parts list, and MCU code at magidavid.com. I hope you've enjoyed the video and please rate, comment, and subscribe. Thanks for watching.